The amplitude of all the waves increases during inspiration. The cervical venous pulsation ceases when the jugular veins are compressed at the root of the neck. Light pressure of the finger against the root of the external jugular vein distends the upper part of the vessel. On removing the finger, the vein collapses to the level of the mean jugular venous pressure. Sir Thomas Lewis pointed out that the most satisfactory reference point from which to measure the venous pressure was the sternal angle, because this was about five centimeters above the center of the right atrium in both horizontal and vertical positions. With reference to the sternal angle, the venous pressure swings around the mean level of about minus two centimeters in the horizontal position, but the range is considerable. Indeed, in this normal subject, the maximum systolic level, which happens to be A, is plus 3.5 centimeters. Let us now look at some abnormalities of the venous pulse. A giant A wave, abrupt and collapsing in quality, and measuring between 6 and 15 millimeters of mercury above V is usual in tricuspid stenosis and atresia, but is equally characteristic of severe pulmonary hypertension and severe pulmonary stenosis. It is palpable and transmitted to the liver and tends to be increased by inspiration. Here is a case of mitral stenosis with severe reactive pulmonary hypertension due to a high pulmonary vascular resistance. The giant A is well seen in the right internal jugular pulse and measures about six centimeters above the sternal angle. On inspiration, its amplitude increases even though the mean right atrial pressure may fall. And here is a man with severe pulmonary valve stenosis with normal aortic root. He has a conspicuous A wave. The cyanosis is due to reversed into atrial shunt, also the slight clubbing of the fingers. You see the venous pulse is moving the lobe of the ear. That the large venous wave is presystolic can be seen by timing it against the temporal arterial pulse, which may be observed just in front of the ear. It is shown very clearly there. From this angle, the height of the A wave may be compared with the height of V, which can also be seen just there in the supraclavicular fossa. You can see V just coming up. The giant A wave also occurs in tricuspid atresia particularly when associated with a foramen ovale rather than a large atrial sepal defect. Such was the case in this signer's girl. The degree of clubbing emphasizes the low level of the arterial oxygen saturation. The giant A wave is well seen. Timed against the carotid pulse, it is obviously presystolic. The time relationship between the venous and arterial pulses may be analyzed by inspection in this closer view. You can see the arterial pulse in that uh, shadow there, just below the lobe of the ear. The powerful right atrial contraction responsible for the giant A wave is due to increased resistance to right ventricular filling acting over a long period of time. It serves to increase the contractile force of the right ventricle in accordance with Starling's law, which states that within certain limits, the force of cardiac contraction varies directly with the length of the muscle fibers at the end of diastole. The giant A wave rarely occurs in pulmonary hypertension when there is free communication between the ventricles, as in phallus tetralogy on the left there and Eisenmenger's complex on the right. Here is the child with phallus tetralogy and you see very little in the neck, just a very small A wave. Here is the patient with Eisenmenger's complex, and in these circumstances, the right ventricular systolic pressure never rises above systemic level, and the right ventricle is able to adapt itself to this ceiling with little help from its atrium. 